Hello and welcome to the PC Security Channel. This is going to be an introduction to reverse engineering, kind of a behind the scenes of doing malware analysis, how we discover new threats, analyze them, write signatures, so on. This video is brought to you by the TPSC Discord and the Steam giveaways we have on it. If you ever wanted to participate in that, this is also going to be an introductory video that should help you acquire the skills that you will need to solve these kind of challenges. Now, if you're completely new to the topic, you may not even know what reverse engineering is. It's quite simple, really. As the name suggests, it's the reverse of engineering. So engineering is building things, and reverse engineering is breaking them down to figure out how they were built. I'm not going to waste too much time on Wikipedia definitions, which you can look up yourself, but I'll be going through a practical example, showing you different approaches and techniques, and hopefully that's going to be quite informative and educational. So to get started... We have this file on our desktop called giveaway1, which was essentially the first challenge. It was created by one of our community members and moderators, Buzzle, and inside it is hidden a Steam key for a PC game, and therefore boundless hours of joy. The only question is, how do we get it? Well, it's pretty simple, just run the file. Except, when you do that, it asks you to input a password. But I don't know the password, you might say. And this is where the reverse engineering mindset needs to kick in. So you need to realize that in order to know if you've typed the right password, the right password must already be known to the application, right? Which means inside this executable, assuming it does not communicate with the internet, somewhere is hidden the right password. You just have to discover it. Or you can just guess it. I'm just going to go with the first method because I'm feeling lucky today. So I think the password is password. Ah, luck runs out. So now we need to use some skills. Well, actually not, because this challenge is ridiculously easy. All you have to do is open Notepad. Wait, this makes no sense, right? But you'll be surprised how many executables you can just read on Notepad. Because at the end of the day, executable code still has strings in it, and a lot of them are directly readable as plain text. So let's see what happens when we drag our file into Notepad. Most of it looks like gibberish, which is perfectly normal, but you can figure out bits of information, like this program cannot be run in DOS mode, which is a common string you'll always find in executables on Windows. But then you can also find other text. Huh. It's a bit more interesting. And if we look closely enough, it looks like we have a string that might resemble the key over here. But this is no fun, right? Cracking a challenge on Notepad. This is for kids. This is for whoever won the challenge. Congratulations, well done. But if this is all I showed you, I'm sure you'd just dislike and go away. So instead of just getting the key, we're going to reverse engineer this file in its entirety and figure out everything about how it works, which I think is a much better challenge. And let's face it, this was giveaway one. 2, 3, and 4 were much harder, and so is most malware, so you do often need more than Notepad to figure out all the secrets that a file holds. Um, by the way, for that person who is just going to comment right now saying that key was base64 encoded, yeah, I know, um, you can decode it easily to get the actual key, we'll talk about that later, okay? But now coming back to the rest of us who are not that impatient, the best way to get kind of an overview of any executable that you find is to put it in some kind of a portable executable analyzer application or some kind of studio. And what that's going to do is filter out all the useful information for you so that you don't have to manually go and look for interesting bits. In this case, I'm just going to use PE Studio. So if we just go into tools, I have PE Studio in here. We'll just open that and then we'll just drag this file in. And quickly enough, we should be able to get a lot of information about this file. First of all, we do know it uses 32 bit. It's a console executable. We can see the compiler stamp. Now, if we actually go into strings, we will find a lot of information that we didn't notice before. For example, we can see the entire debug path. So this is where Buzzle keeps all his dark secrets. D drive, development projects, giveaways, giveaway one, main.c. So it is a C file as well. Another way of figuring that out would have been just to look at this, which is the compiler, that is GCC, that tells you it's either a C or C++ file. Now if we just scroll down here, we can also find another directory. Now we also know the IDE puzzle used to create this file, which is code blocks. Pretty common thing in schools. 
but unfortunately that's the extent of which PStudio can help us. To actually do a deeper analysis of the application, we'll need to debug it using something preferably like OliDPG. So that's what I'm going to do next. We do have OliDPG here, and now we'll open the file inside of it. I know this all looks extremely scary as a beginner, but trust me, it's not that hard. First of all, a debugger is essentially an application that you can use to figure out bugs in your program, to troubleshoot it, to run specific parts of it, and see if they work. But you can also do that to figure out how a program is written by running specific sections, seeing what each section does, and that's what we'll be doing. So what you see over here is assembly code, or the low-level instructions that the program is using to communicate with the processor. For example, these things called ESP, EAX, these are registers on the CPU that can store information. The things on the left like MOV, call, JMP, these are commands. So MOV is for move, call is for call, JMP is jump, and so on. Now if we actually load our file, we can notice a few interesting bits. Starting off with input a password. This is the message that first pops up. We haven't gotten there yet. Then we have a message locked. Then we have a message, wait, you didn't see this before. Congrats, your key is dot dot dot. Now if we go on to the left hand side and try to analyze what's happening, we can see that over here, it's simply asking us for the password, but how does it know whether we entered the right one? And that's being done over here with strcmp. So it's essentially comparing the two strings. And in order to do that, it has to first move the string that it has into a register, and then it has to move the string that it gets from the command line into another register and then compare the two. And this is being done over here in test, it's character by character. And then depending on what it finds, it has separate jump instructions. But what if we told this application to entirely avoid the password checking part and start directly after that? Well, we'd be stuck in an infinite loop of uh, locked. That's not very useful. But what if we skip that as well and go straight to the part where it says, congrats, your key is, and we'll do that right now. We'll start a new origin here and we'll run that. And let's see what happens. So it essentially waits for a few seconds. It says the program has encountered a weird error and then it goes back into an infinite loop saying missing number. So likely this is just a diversion, which may mean that there's no password anyway, but we'll kind of try to see if that's the case. So at this point we know that even if you have the password and you type it in, this is all you're going to get. So our efforts to figure out the password are futile, which is a bit of a shame, but we'll do it anyway. But how do we find out the key? Does the application give you the key at all? Well, if you take a look at it, it actually does. Below the part where it says the program has encountered weird error and it goes into the loop of missing number, there's this statement. What if we just set the origin here? And simple enough, if we do that, there you go, the message is printed on the screen. We have the key we need. But we still don't know the password, and I'm determined to figure it out. So let's see what we can do for that. First, I'm gonna restart the application, and we'll go back to the start. So we're still stuck here. So somewhere in here, there's a comparison happening that's telling it whether or not the key is correct. Now I could have suspected that maybe there is no comparison, right? It could just be a bluff. But looking at the assembly code, we do know that something is being tested. So there is a comparison, and we also know that strcmp is used. Now the likely reason we're not seeing any password over here is simply because it's being stored as a character array. So it's scattered and hidden in plain sight, you can say. But it's still rather easy to figure it out, and I'll show you how. We don't even need to go character by character and put it all together. We do know that the characters are being loaded into one of these registers. I'm gonna guess it's right over here. We can see the current character that's loaded. Now I do know that the password bits have to be loaded into the registers for a comparison. So I'm just gonna type a bluff password, some random nonsense, press enter, and boom. There you go. We now know exactly what was loaded into the registers. So ECX was loaded with challenge one and EDX loaded with the password I provided. So challenge one is likely the right password. And we can test that. And now we just need to run the application and say challenge 
one. And boom, we figured out the password as well. But in any case, in case you wanna know how to figure out the final key, decoding base64 is as simple as doing a Google search. By the way, um, so what is base64? It's essentially just a mapping technique, kind of like ASCII, just to encode bits in a certain format. It's not particularly hard to do. You could do it manually, but well, to save time, it's always better to do it this way. Just use notepad to quickly grab the string. Now, if you couldn't guess that this was base64, I could do that from experience, but you can just try different encoding techniques and see if that resembles something you're looking for. In this case, if we just try to put it into base64 and click on decode, we get the message, congrats, your key is this, which is exactly what we were looking for. This challenge was solved weeks ago and the key's already been activated, so you're not gonna get the game <laughs> by watching the video. But as they say, give a man a fish and he won't be hungry for a day, but teach a man to fish, he won't be hungry forever. You now have the skills to solve these kind of puzzles. Let me know in the comments below if you like this video. I hope you found it useful. I hope it gave you some insight as to how to approach reverse engineering and how we use it to figure out properties of malware, for example. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Also, do let me know if you'd like to see more content like this on the channel. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Peace Security channel, check out the website, and do head over to our Discord server if you'd like to participate in things like this. This is Leo, and as always, stay informed, stay secure.